Okay, if we could turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, and we're in chapter 13. I'm going to read the first 16 verses, although we may get beyond there, uh, but it's a nice breaking point in the text. And so we'll begin uh, in verse 1. It says this way, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them, and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Uh, have ye not see, seen a vain vision, and have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say, the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And my hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Because even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Say unto them, which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, with a great stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, then the wall is fallen. Shall it not be said unto you, where is the daubing? wherewith you have daubed it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. So will I break down the wall that you have daubed with untempered mortar, and bring it down to the ground, so that the foundations thereof shall be discovered, and it shall fall, and you shall be consumed." In the midst thereof, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall, and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar, and will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord God. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them. And the Lord again will bless that reading of his precious word to us. So the subject this morning, as is pretty obvious from the reading, is false prophets and false prophetesses. Uh, 1 through 16 uh, deals with false prophets. And then from 17 down to verse 23 deals with false prophetesses. And it all goes back to the previous chapter. And in the previous chapter, we saw that there was false optimism amongst the people. They were convinced uh, that the walls of Jerusalem uh, would uh, give the stability uh, to the nation and that uh, the Babylonians would not conquer them and that they would be safe. They felt like they were the choice meat uh, in the pot and they would be completely safe. And of course, it was completely false. Uh, in fact, God said he's going to tip the pot over and they're going to be emptied out, scattered, killed, all the rest of it. So there was this great false optimism amongst the people. And so it was as a result, really, of the work of false prophets uh, what we could say is that in the previous chapter, uh, he deals with the symptoms, the false optimism. In this chapter, he's dealing with the root cause. Why did they have this wrong view? And it was because of false prophets. And what we'll see is that false prophets and prophetesses were a thorn in the side 
of both Jeremiah and Ezekiel throughout their ministry. They were constantly combating against these false prophets, false prophetesses, who were giving a contrary message to the true prophets of God. And so we're going from the symptoms to the, the root cause. And these false prophets, uh, what the Lord is going to do is he's going to accuse them of undermining the stability of the nation when it needed to be strengthened and built uh, they were undermining it uh, with their false messages. You'll see that in verse 5. You have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They've actually had an undermining ministry. And what they've done is they gave their blessing to a crumbling edifice of the state when it should have been condemned and reconstructed afresh based on repentance and brokenness. And you'll see in verse 10, because even because they have seduced my people, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace, and one built up a wall, lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. They're kind of covering over the cracks instead of dealing with the real issues uh, that were needed to be dealt with in the nation. So it begins this way, chapter 13, verse 1, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. So the true prophet of God, who if we recall, could not speak, uh, thinking of Ezekiel, unless God opened his mouth, removed his muteness, and gave him a message. He is now to address the false prophets. And I want just to remind us that the previous chapter, on four different occasions, there's kind of four paragraphs in the previous chapter, and they all begin with the same phrase. You notice in verse 1 of chapter 12, the word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, you see it again in verse 8, second paragraph, in the morning came the word of the Lord unto me, saying. Verse 17, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. Verse 21, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. And verse 26, again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, and here we are again, chapter 13, verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. And so, in contrast to these false prophets who really do not have a word from God, here's a, the prophet of God, and constantly we hear this refrain, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. And so, we just want to see the contrast there that uh, God is um, speaking and emphasizing that he is speaking through this man, Ezekiel. It's the word of the Lord coming through him. On the other hand, these false prophets, he says, they're not speaking from me. It says, they prophesy, say unto them, that prophesy out of their own heart. <laughs> That's the source of their prophecy, it comes out of their own heart. Now, can you see a problem with that? If you don't see a problem with that, let me show you a problem with that. Look at Jeremiah 17, book of Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. I think we know this verse pretty well, uh, but here's where their ministry is coming from. It's coming from their own heart. And what does God say about the heart of man? He says in verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. So Jeremiah 17, 9 and desperately wicked who can know it. And so their ministry is one of prophesying out of their own hearts rather than a word that comes from God. And you know, the amazing thing is that the message in our day from our culture is this, follow your heart. Have you ever heard anybody say that? You just, if you want to be happy, you just follow your heart. Well, I want to tell you that's a recipe for disaster. Because if you follow your heart, your heart is so deceitful, it will lead you completely in the wrong direction. And so here are these prophets, they, their message that they're giving, it comes out of their own heart. They're religious opportunities who spoke out of their own hearts in contrast to the true prophets of God who said, this is the word of the Lord. They had a message from God. Thus saith the Lord. And we see it again. He says in verse 3, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit 
and have seen nothing. Of course, uh, we can we can contrast that quickly with Ezekiel. Did he see anything? Well, yeah, he saw a vision of the glory of God, didn't he? <laughs> Uh, was there a spirit working in him? Well, yeah, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And so very different to these prophets who have not seen a thing. They haven't seen anything uh, of God, no visions of his glory or anything like that. And they're, they're following their own spirit rather than the Holy Spirit. And so uh, it's just interesting. We're thinking about prophets, but I want to just talk, talk, talk for a moment about the test of a true prophet. How do we know if a man who claims to be speaking from God is really speaking from God? And God had some tests in the word of God to help his people discern if a prophet was speaking from God or out of his own heart or out of his own spirit. And so Deuteronomy 13, again, this foundational book that was preparing them as they entered into the land, uh, and uh, warning them against dangers that they would face. And he, he says in chapter 13 of Deuteronomy, and we'll, we'll read the first five verses, it says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, so he may even have some kind of miraculous thing that goes along with what he does, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whether he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. So the first thing we could say is that maybe a prophet has some kind of supernatural manifestation, but you have to test his message. Is it going to lead you away from the true God towards other gods, or is it going to lead you to God, to the true and living God? If it's going to lead you away from God, it's a false message. You shall walk after the Lord your God, verse 4, and fear him, keep his commandments, obey his voice. You shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. So the first thing, the first test is, no matter how miraculous he may seem, where does the ministry lead? Does it lead you? to the true God and obedience to him, or does it lead you to false gods? Remember the idolatry that was so crippling Judah, uh, and of course the prophets were not condemning that. They were not turning the people, these false prophets, they weren't turning the people back to the true and living God, and so they were clearly false. Now another portion of Deuteronomy chapter 18 gives us another little test in verse 21 and 22. And this is a very interesting one. It says, And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, He, uh, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So here's a second test, and that is this. If a man prophesies and what he says doesn't come to pass, he's clearly a bogus, false prophet. And it is interesting. Um, I, I know we're coming up here in the U.S. to an election, but I remember distinctly last election. Uh, so that would be 2020. And YouTube was full of so-called prophets, Chris, Christian supposedly prophets. And they all gave a unified message. And the message was that President Trump would win a second consecutive term. And there were tons of them out there. And he didn't. <laughs> so what they said didn't come to pass. And actually, in Deuteronomy, what they would do with those kind of people is thrown them to death. What's amazing to me is that they're still on YouTube and they're still supposedly prophesying in the name of the Lord and they, they're not accountable. <laughs> to, And so, again, how do we test them? Does their ministry lead us towards the Lord or 
towards false gods, false ideas, and does it come to pass? Those are the tests that were given under the Old Testament economy. Now, of course, we mentioned how these individuals, they really were a thorn in the side of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I want to just take a minute just to look at Jeremiah and the the, the problem he had with these false prophets, giving a contrary message. So let's look at Jeremiah 5 just for a moment. We're just we're going to run through quickly, but I think it's just an interesting exercise to see how uh, these false prophets plagued uh, Jeremiah's ministry. And so <clears throat> verse 30 of Jeremiah 5, a wonderful and horrible thing is uh, committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their own means. In other words, their own ambition uh, gets them positions of priests. And he says, my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? And here's a tragedy. God's people actually liked it. <laughs> my people like it so. And that was a problem. They liked the message. Why would they like the message of the false prophets so much? Because they told them what they wanted to hear, not what they needed to hear. See, people love, you know, the words that will uh, encourage them in their rebellion and sin and won't confront them. They don't like a message that confronts their wayward behavior. And uh, so they, they love the prophets because they told them what they wanted to hear. They had smooth words. Uh, chapter 14 and verse 13 of Jeremiah. Uh, then said I, our Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, you shall not see the sword, neither shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. And the Lord said to me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name. I sent them not, yet they say that sword and famine shall not be in the land. By sword and famine shall these prophets be consumed. And it goes on all the way through verse 18. But you get the message giving them a message they want to hear. Uh, who wants to hear uh, that we're going to, uh, you know, face divine judgment? We want a message that says everything's fine and uh, you'll just continue on as normal and you don't need to repent of your sins. You're doing okay. Everything is just perfect. Uh, Jeremiah 23, we won't take the time to read it, but Jeremiah 23 is a parallel passage. And from verse 9 through 40, uh, you have God's condemnation of the false prophets who are prophesying lies. Uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 8 through 10. It's just a refrain all the way through that he's he's combating these false uh, preachers, false prophets. It says, verse 8, But thus saith the Lord God, this is Jeremiah 29, verse 8, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I'll visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I have towards you, so on and so forth. So they were saying, oh, you know, you're not going to go into Babylon. The true prophet is saying you're going to spend 70 years in captivity as a result of your failure to keep the sabbatic years and all the other issues. Uh, but the false prophets had a completely different message. And so this is really plaguing them all the way through. So what about us? Is there any relevance to you and I in the portion that we're looking at this morning? Well, I want you to look with me just for a second at Second Peter. Second Peter. And one of the things that Peter warns us about is not so much false prophets, although there, as we've already heard, there are those that are claiming to be prophets, although we believe that that prophets were Acts two twenty uh, Ephesians two twenty were foundational, right for the foundation of the church. Uh, apostles and prophets, church is built on the foundation. Uh, so they were they were there in the early days of the church, but the, the the actual gift is now passed from the scene of time, and Peter would confirm that he says in Second Peter two verse one. But there were false prophets also among the people. 
clearly a problem for the nation of Israel, as there shall be false teachers among you who privily or in a sneaky, secret way shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And sadly, here's the sad refrain, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And so the idea is that there's going to be false teachers in the church and they're going to cause the way of truth to be evil spoken of. Don't we see that in our day? Aren't there these health wealth preachers flying around in their private jets, got their fleet of Mercedes Benzes saying, this is your best life now and all the rest of it. And they've got a message that is so contrary to the idea of denying self and the, the true discipleship that the scripture speaks of. And yet many follow their pernicious ways. They love these. And many of them, they're, they're such heretics. They say, you can be basically your own God. You can command God with your own words. Uh, the word of faith movement, all this kind of stuff. I mean, just damnable heresies. And yet their popularity uh, grows and increases constantly. And so this is, uh, we face the same problem. And uh, one of the scripture, Acts chapter 20, uh, Paul warning uh, the elders at Ephesus about what's going to happen. And he says in verse uh, Acts 20 um, and verse 30, he says also, and this is a sad word, of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things, truth with a twist, perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Now, I want you just to get that, draw away disciples after them. Uh, they want their own fan club. Uh, they want their own followers to follow them. And what is a biblical mandate? Paul says this, follow me as I follow Christ. We're really to make disciples after the Lord Jesus, not after ourselves. And so this is a warning uh, that we're seeing here, that this passage in, in Ezekiel has relevance to us. <clears throat> Notice we, we said they speak out of their own hearts. Their sin was they follow their own human fallible spirit instead of the divine, infallible, Holy Spirit. And what does God do? Well, he pronounces a woe unto them. Notice again, verse 3, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Seen nothing. The word nothing is vanity. And so, woe upon the foolish prophets. As opposed to Ezekiel, who's definitely seen some amazing things, visions of the glory of God, vision of coming judgment, now, and also, uh, he moved by the Holy Spirit, just as we're told in, again in Second Peter, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. These people are just moved by their own human spirit, not by the Holy Spirit. And so notice he also uses the term, woe unto the foolish prophets. I want to just take a few moments and talk about the biblical definition of a fool and what that leads to. You know, it's uh, sometimes in our culture, it's almost considered to be cool to be a fool. <laughs> but God says, no, 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 no. It's not cool to be a fool. Uh, and he talks about what fools are inclined to do. So let's just look at a few scriptures that describe the, uh, the character of, of a fool in the word of God. Psalm 74. I was asked to speak at an event one time and it happened to be April Fool's Day. <laughs> and so I, I used the opportunity of talking about a fool according to scripture. And uh, there's just so much insight in the word of God about it. Psalm 74 verse 18. Remember this, that the enemy hath reproached, O Lord, and that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. So one of the things that we could say is that a fool 
is inclined towards blasphemy. That's a very serious thing, isn't it? To be inclined towards blasphemy. Foolish people have blasphemed thy name. Also, they have a propensity towards atheism. Psalm 14, we sometimes think that some of these atheists are, you know, they, they kind of pose as intellectuals. Psalm 14 says, the fool, notice what, what here, what's going on, hath said in his heart, there is no God. Or literally, there is, is in italics, the fool has said in his heart, no God. And then notice what it says next. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. And the idea is this, that atheism, which is the characteristic of a fool, is not based on intellectualism. It's based on immorality. The reason they're saying no God is because God cramps their style. They have done abominable works. Don't be intimidated by these intellectuals who deny God, realize behind it there is an immorality that doesn't want God because he, in their opinion, is going to spoil their party. Uh, look at First Samuel now, please. First Samuel. Again, we're just looking and considering the fool just for a moment. And we don't want to be. We want The scripture just talks a lot about being the wise man and not being the fool. Lord, help us to be wise men and women. Psalm, uh, uh, 1 Samuel 25, verse 25, we read about a man. Of course, the word here, actually, that he uses for foolish is a word <clears throat> that we're familiar with. It's a word, Nabal. And it says in verse 25 of 1 Samuel 25, it says, Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, this worthless man, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. So here's the description of a man, he was churlish, he was arrogant, and he lived up to his name. Nabal means fool, and this man was a foolish man. And so you see that there's an arrogance and a churlishness that comes along with being a fool. And then the final one I want us to look at as we kind of digress and just think about the fool according to Scripture, Second Samuel 13. In verse 13, this is a very sad story. It's the rape and incestual act of Ammon with Tamar. And what does Tamar say to, to Ammon? She says in verse 13, And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, Speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. And so Tamar's words are, remind us that a fool is capable of the grossest immorality. You see, the fool is not somebody to be emulated. And God talks about these prophets, and he says, Woe unto the Nabal prophets. Woe unto the foolish prophets. Very opposite that God commends is the wise man. Oh, Lord, help us to be known as wise. Wise uh, in, of course, the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom. And of course, all these attributes we've seen, this blasphemous heart, this atheistic heart, this churlish and arrogant, this immorality, all of these things are the very opposite of somebody who's walking in the fear of the Lord. And so, again, don't be a fool. Now, notice verse 4, he says, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. He's going to talk about two different kind of word pictures here, foxes in the deserts, and then these walls that are covered with untempered mortar. So, first of all, foxes in a desert. What does this mean? So, deserts in the, in the sense of deserted habitations, foxes among ruins, we might say, making dens for themselves, or to change a metaphor, and maybe this will help us, the foxes in these deserted places making dens for themselves 
are like feathering their own nest in a place of destruction and desolation. And so the idea is this, that these false prophets, they were preying on the devastation around them, scavengers <laughs> looking out only for themselves. They did nothing to improve the situation in a time of crisis. There are always religious opportunists who will prey on weak, ignorant people who are seeking assurance and comfort. <laughs> and so they basically were literally feathering their own nests. They were building their own dens out of the devastation that was going on, the time of the siege and all of these things. Okay, second thing is, uh, again, in, from verse 5 onwards, that what a prophet should do is repair, repair a breach in a wall. So I'll just look at, for instance, at Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 12, prophet Isaiah chapter 58, verse 12, and then we'll look at uh, these verses from verse 5 onwards, bearing this thought in mind. So Isaiah 58, 12, we read this very, very important scripture. It says this, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. So you can see that the true man of God, what is he going to do? He's going to restore the foundations, as it were. He's going to repair the breaches. He, he's going to make the foundations strong again uh, for many generations. He's going to get back to that which we can build upon that's solid. He's going to bring people back to those things. But when we look at these men, he says back in verse 5 of chapter 13, you have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel, to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. So they, they haven't made things better. They haven't, as it were, been a restorer of the breaches. Um, they've encouraged the people, in, what true prophets would encourage the people to repent, turn to the Lord. They were called the, uh, the restorers of the breaches. These men failed miserably to repair the breaches. The only hope for Israel was repentance and not soothing words. These false prophets failed to provide the message the nation needed. They did not stand in the battle on the Lord's side. And men like Jeremiah and Ezekiel were trying to repair the spiritual wall that had defended Israel. But these false prophets, not at all. And as a result of that, they fail to help people stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Now, of course, usually the day of the Lord refers to coming judgment at the end times. However, it also is used in times like this in the Old Testament with a reference to imminent trouble, and in this case, the coming fall of Jerusalem. Instead of restoring the nation through rebuilding the spiritual foundations, uh, they were really covering it over. And we're going to see that in verse 6 onwards. Now, I want you just to notice from verse uh, 6 down to verse 9, I just want to point this out before we go verse by verse through these verses. But there's a, there's a repetition of vanity and lying in these verses. So notice verse 6, they have seen vanity and lying divination saying, verse 7, have you not seen a vain vision? And I, have you not spoken a lying divination? Verse 8, therefore thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies. And verse 9, and mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. So quite clearly, this little section is about vanity and lying din divination. They have seen vanity and lying divination they were claiming that the lord had spoken through them but he had not satan is a master counterfeiter and so they're claiming to be from the lord but they're not 
and their message is, is empty. It's vain. Uh, it has no substance to it. And of course, just to remind ourselves, and it's really, it's important. This is really an important section because we're facing the same thing. The New Testament talks about false prophets, false apostles, false teachers, false disciples, and ultimately a false messiah. And of course, all of these are counterfeits. Of course, the existence of counterfeits is proof of the genuine. We know that there's a lot of demonic deception. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, uh, talks about the latter days and talks about the, the demonic activity. And it uses this language, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons. And so quite clearly, the last days, very difficult times, and there's going to be a lot of deception, doctrines of demons, and a lot of falsehood, false prophets, apostles, teachers, disciples, and ultimately the false end time Messiah. And their message is going to be empty. It's a vain message and based on lies, lying divinations. And so they emphasize the great care that should be taken by anyone who presumes to speak in the name of the Lord. It's not a light thing to take his name upon our lips. In the New Testament, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11 says that if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And of course, the, the emphasizes the great responsibility on, on the man who speaks publicly. The word oracle is is from the Greek word logion, logion like like the word logos, and it's a it's a it's a diminutive of the logos, a word narrative or statement denoting a divine response or utterance. And so the idea is when a man speaks to the assembly, he must address the Lord's people as if he is speaking on God's behalf. With ministry that is coming from the sanctuary, from time spent in the presence of God. And if we come vaguely wondering what to say, people will leave vaguely wondering what we said. We need to make sure we have a message from God, from the assembly, and it's not empty or even deceptive in its content. These people, lying divination and vanity is what marked them and so very very sad very sobering but there are consequences to their actions and so what are some of the consequences of their actions it says they've seen vanity lying divination verse 6 saying the lord saith the lord hath not sent them they've made others to hope that they would confirm the word so they've given people a false hope have you not seen a vain vision? Have you not spoken a lying divination where you say, the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken? So they're presuming to speak in God's behalf, and he has not given them that message. Therefore, here's the consequences for what they're doing. Thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord. Now, that should cause a person to shudder. We often rejoice in the fact that we read in Romans great truths like this. If God be for us, who can be against us? That we rejoice in the truth that God is with us. But sadly, he says to these prophets, I am against you. Oh, how frightening that is to have God against you. And as a result of their lying vanity, there are consequences. Look at verse 9. And this is, you know, again, the principle. What a man sows, that shall he also reap. He says, mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. There are three things here. They lose their prominent place in the councils of the nation. 
You know, these were people that had an influence. They're going to lose that influence, uh, that place of prominence in the councils of Israel. Secondly, God would treat them like Jews who had lost their citizenship. Uh, that's a very frightening thing. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. There was a, they lose their place in the genealogical record of Israel. Uh, we see something like that in the book of Ezra. Let me just read you a scripture in Ezra 2 and verse 59 of those that returned from captivity. And some of them, they had a hard time proving that they were part of the congregation of Israel. And it says in verse 59, And there were they which went up from uh, Telmola, uh, and it lists a group of names. I won't try and even read them. It says, But they could not show their father's house and their seed, whether they were of Israel. Verse 62, that yeah, those that sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, they were as polluted, put from the priesthood. And so the idea is this, they would lose their citizenship in the commonwealth of Israel. That's a very solemn thing, isn't it? To lose your citizenship in the commonwealth of Israel. By the way, it's a wonderful thing to know that we can't lose our heavenly citizenship. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. I remember one time when we had just become citizens and uh, my wife uh, had lost our naturalization certificate <laughs> and uh, it was a nightmare to have to find it and get it back uh, we had to apply for another one it took us a long time she lost the proof that we were u.s citizens and that was a, a devastating thing and so it was hard to get it back but we'll never lose our heavenly citizenship but these people were going to lose their citizenship in the house of israel and because of that they would be deprived of the privilege of returning to their land What's their real crime? Well, notice verse 10. Because, even because they have seduced my people, saying, peace, and there was no peace. One built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. I want to talk about this untempered mortar. Some have suggested that it's like whitewash. They're just whitewashing things. Have you ever heard the term? They're just whitewashing it. They're just covering up. They're, instead of repairing, they're just covering it up. And so he says um, their message, one of peace, when there was no peace. Uh, remember, false prophets tell people what they want to hear. True prophets tell people what they need to hear. I also want you to notice that uh, there's another kind of a repetition in this chapter that is very significant. Notice verse nine, he talks about my people. Mine hell shall be upon the prophets that see vanity, divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people. Verse 10, because even because they have seduced my people. And then further down in chapter in verse 18, now we're speaking about the false prophetesses. And it says, in the last sentence, it says, will you hunt the souls of my people? And will you save the souls alive that come unto you? And verse 19, will you pollute me among my people? And then at the end of verse 19, to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies. And then verse 21 your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand. Verse 23, therefore you shall see no more vanity nor divine divinations, for I will deliver my people out of your hands. And so the thought here is this, that these, these false prophets and false prophetesses, why God is so distressed about what they're doing is they're seducing his people. God holds people accountable who deliver a false message to his people. Uh, he, he's concerned about his people. The well-being of his people means a lot to him. We see that in the church age. In the church age, he talks to the shepherds and he talks about the fact that they're caring for people 
who he has purchased with his own blood. In other words, he's emphasizing to the shepherds, don't, this is in Acts chapter 20, don't you realize how much value I place upon these people because of the great price that I have paid for them? They were purchased by the blood of his own son. And so we, we need to be very careful and remind ourselves we're dealing with his blood-bought people in this New Testament age, and we must be careful that we do not in any way uh, intentionally deceive them or play to the choir and give them a message they want to hear rather than one they need to hear. And so very, very solemn message here uh, that he's bringing before them that they are uh, doing this. Now, of course, he he, he says, send to them which daub it with untempered, this is verse 11, mortar, that it shall fall, there shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. So he, he showing that they're really poor workmen, using untempered mortar to repair a damaged wall. It's, it was a kind of whitewash, some people say like a lime wash. Uh, it made the wall look strong, but the first storm that came along and the wall came down. That's the picture. And of course, you see down in verse 15 and 16, where God says, thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar and will say to you, the wall is no more, neither they that daubed it, to wit the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, which see visions of peace for her. There is no peace, saith the Lord God. So basically, they're, they're trying to cover over the cracks by, by using whitewash rather than dealing with the real problems. Uh, the reason there was cracks in the wall was because of the idolatry of the nation, because of their sin. That What they needed was repentance and a repairing of the foundations. And instead, all they did was they whitewashed, covered over uh, the sins of the people. Uh, every defect was covered over. The smooth words of false prophets try and cover over every defect rather than bringing correction and stability, like fixing the wall. The wall was a flimsy wall. It stands for the empty hopes that they were erecting for themselves, which the false prophets were blandly endorsing. And so he says in verse 12, he says, Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where is the daubing wherewith you have daubed it? And so when the disaster occurred, the workmen will be blamed and accused. I thought you were supposed to fix the problem. <laughs> uh, you've done nothing to help the problem. Verse 13, therefore saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger and great hailstones in my fury to uh, consume it. And of course, in chapter 1, verse 4, the first thing that Ezekiel had seen was a whirlwind coming out of the north. And of course, the idea is that the, 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 the main point of that was a storm is about to break on the nation. Uh, if we just go back there, it says, I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and fire enfolding itself. A brightness was about it out of the midst there of the color of amber, out of the midst of it fire. And of course, the idea is it was God, God's chariot thrown. But the picture was that out of the north is coming uh, a storm and God is in the storm. He's bringing the storm. It's a storm of divine judgment on the nation. And it would ex God's anger and fury uh, this city would crumble and the false prophets would perish with it. So he says, verse 14, I'll break down the wall that you have daubed with untempered mortars and bring it down to the ground so the foundations thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall and you shall be consumed in the midst thereof and you shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar will say unto you, the wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. So the shoddy workmen who had given visions of peace when there was no peace are going to perish in the wall when the Lord brings his fury against it. And again, it's um, all this popular optimism identified with the city of Jerusalem, and they thought it was impregnable, 
Uh, their hopes had been based on this, that they were in this city and it wouldn't fall. They'd been given this false message and it was destined to crumble. And the false prophets themselves would be buried in the ruins they said would not fall. Thankful that we have our hope based on a more sure word of prophecy. Isn't it wonderful that we're not basing our hopes on false prophets? The promises of God, in all of them, we know, in him, in the Lord Jesus, are yea and amen. We're thankful for a God who cannot lie. Like Abraham, we're fully persuaded that he that has promised is able to perform. And so we have a sure hope, more sure word of prophecy than what these false prophets were giving. But at the same time, we have to ask ourselves, is our ministry repairing the breaches? Is it, is it dealing with the things that are need to be put right? Are we telling people what they need to hear rather than what they want to hear? Are we giving their true diagnosis and the true solution to human problems? And of course, it's all down to the truth of the word of God applied directly to the heart. So that leads us to verse 17 down to verse 23. And the second woe that is pronounced on false prophetesses. So he says, likewise, just as you've done to the prophets, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart and prophesy thou against them. So now we have an issue. We have women prophetesses. Now, the fact that there were legitimate women prophetesses in scripture is quite clear. And let's just look at some of them. There are not many of them, but there are a few. And so one of them is Miriam. Uh, if we look at Exodus 15, uh, she is so designated that way. And verse 20 it says, Exodus 15, 20, And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hands, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. So here we have one who is called the prophetess. Um, of course, we have the book of Judges, and uh, we've been uh, happily been through Judges together, but we will remember Deborah, and in Judges 4, and verse 4 and 5, we read this. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time, and she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So again, there's another prophetess. Um, also, Second Kings and chapter 22 2 Kings 22, verse 14, we find another prophetess. It says, So Hilkiah the priest, and Ahiakim, and Akbor, and Shaphan, and Asiah, went unto Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, the son of Harris, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. So we have some prophetesses legitimately mentioned in the Old Testament. We also have a very curious scripture in the book of Acts, chapter 21. And we read about Philip, the evangelist. And we'll notice in verse 8 and 9, it says, And next day... Uh, we were, we that were of Paul's company departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him, and the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And then, of course, as well as the true prophetesses, there were also some false ones. 
I'm just going to name them, give the text, and then our time will be done and we'll have to deal with them next time, uh, this idea of the prophetesses. But one is in the book of Nehemiah, uh, chapter 6, verse 14, who was a prophetess but was certainly working in conjunction with the enemy uh, rather than with the Lord, and that's Numbers uh, Nehemiah 6 and verse 14 where we read this, My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sambala according to those uh, their, these their works, and on the prophetess Noah Dyer and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. So they're working against Nehemiah and his construction job. And then in the New Testament, we have one very dubious prophetess, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. And we read these words, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Well, we'll have to wait till next time to deal with these prophetesses and false prophetesses. Yeah, but until then, be sure that if we speak, we speak as the oracles of God. Amen.